This is Rohatsu Sashin, 2019. It's day five, which is a significant day. And talk six, since we have a talk, the opening night, short talk. I am very, very grateful that you have made spiritual practice your priority for this week. Now you have set aside all your obligations and responsibilities and hobbies, enjoyments at home, work and family, that you've gathered resources, that you've made travel arrangements, and that you've taken all those resources that you usually spend in other ways, resources of body, heart, and mind, to come here and practice in this concentrated way together. Everyone has been practicing so earnestly. And I don't care what the inner critic says in the little voice, you have been. When even one person has a more peaceful mind, then the entire world becomes more peaceful. We have a choice in life to add distress and suffering to the world or to add peace and equanimity and loving kindness. It sounds very simple, but that's basically the choice of our practice. What do we want to add to the world? Even if the peaceful mind only settles and appears for a short time, even only a few times a day, the world becomes more peaceful. It's mathematical. You don't have to analyze it. (laughs) Spiritual practice is a priority if we want to keep this, this person, this person that we are for this lifetime, at least. If we want to keep this person that you are inhabiting truly healthy. Our most basic human need is connection and intimacy. You can examine this like anything that I say for yourself. But we've all had the experience of being hungry, tired and cold. But if we're with friends, we can be happy. Connection is what truly nourishes us beyond food. It's truly what warms us. Without the experience of interconnection, our existing interconnection, which we, when we start to ignore it, or somehow are blinded to it, we fall easily into loneliness. And then we grasp at other people to solve it for us, which they cannot do. Without a reliable source of connection and intimacy, we easily fall into depression. And then we grasp at over-the-counter remedies that help us feel temporarily connected. Alcohol. You watch people drink. They let down barriers and they feel temporarily connected, even though from the outside they might look unhappy. Drugs are exciting or dangerous entertainment. There are many, many ways to try to feel connected that work in short term, but are not reliable. And without a reliable connection to the infinite source of support, the existing intimate, the existing infinite source of support, that source that animates us and everything that exists. It's so easy to fall into anger or despair. When we're out of touch with that boundless source of life, we can't think clearly about our own problems. 
and we're overwhelmed by the many problems in the world, we feel helpless to choose how to act on them. And then we come to Sashin. But it's not enough to come to Sashin for a temporary glow. This is the message of day five. Day five when, you know, we've, we're cruising along, we're feeling pretty good. Some relief of suffering. Okay, I think I'll just lay back. To a certain extent, a kind of laying back is important. But not to just coast. So it's not enough to come to Sashin for a few days of relief from the distressed heart-mind. That was such a relief not to think about work or worry about my family. Yes, that's true. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. But it won't satisfy for long, and it won't, it won't ultimately satisfy. This is my observation from my own practice and from guiding the practice of you know, hundreds of other people. When you reach this stage in Sashin, it's very, very easy to say, oh, enough hard work. And of course the ego agrees. (laughs) And to coast. As I said this morning, the fruits of all the resolve and sustained practice you have put in over the last five days are beginning to emerge and will continue to emerge after the session is over. This is the time to be steady in your practice, to keep refreshing your practice, to start each sitting period without looking back and without looking forward. Start fresh each time you sit down. Align yourself with the flow of things as they are. By now in session, you've had that experience. Align yourself with the flow of things as they are. Be guided into that flow by the flow of the breath, the flow of sounds, the flow of walking, the flow of chanting, the flow of bowing. Continue to be curious. This practice is so wonderful because it continually unfolds if you're just curious. So, for example, when you're chanting, you can bring your awareness to your tongue and just watch what your tongue does. You could never tell it to do that. Okay, go forward, touch back. No, 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 back, 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 up, up, up. Now, down, down, down. (laughs) You couldn't tell it. You would be completely paralyzed. You could not talk. So just watch it, caring for you all the time when you're chanting. It's fascinating. And when thoughts interfere, recognize them, label them, and return to awareness. If labeling helps. Sometimes it helps just to Like, stamp it, okay, that was a thought, and let it go. Dogen Zenzi says it over and over in Genjo Koan. Ordinary life and enlightened life assume many aspects, but we only recognize and understand through practice what the penetrating power of our vision can reach. So to know that the power of our vision expanded by our practice in the last five days, still is limited. Although things may look round or square, the other qualities are infinite in variety. Isn't that intriguing? Furthermore, other universes lie in all quarters. There's a universe in your mouth. There's a universe, a a literal universe, in the microbiome in your belly. Thich Nhat Hanh said, if you really, really eat an orange mindfully, it opens up and into an entire universe. You know, all those little cells, those, they have the little point on one end and then like a jewel. 
how it's all held together. It's amazing. Furthermore, other universes lie in all quarters. It is so not only with ourselves, but also right here and in a single drop of water. Other universes lie within ourselves. Isn't that an awesome promise? We love the idea of exploring outer space, you know. I do. I like reading what the astronauts are doing and what's been discovered about black holes and two black holes and together. But there's a universe within two. An enticement to continue to deepen and expand our practice. Dogen Zenji says, beyond this there is still more to see. It is the same with practice and enlightenment, mortality and immortality. Just those four aspects to continue to explore what practice can reveal. What is enlightenment? Is it sudden? Is it gradual? Could I be enlightened and not know it? Could I be meeting enlightened people and not know it? The same with mortality and immortality. What's with this constant birth and death? What happens when people die? Where do they go? We kind of know where the physical aspects go, but what about the psychical aspects? The love, the anger, the distress, the history, what they learned. Where does what we've learned in practice go? Is there anything we can contribute to someone else after we die? It's these kinds of questions that keep us going in practice. Because the place is right here, and the way leads everywhere, the limits of what can be known cannot be known. That's so wonderful. What a promise. Would you rather get to the end of this amazing exploration we call practice? Or to continue forever? You want to come to the end or do you want to continue forever? (laughs) To continue throughout your life to turn corners? To walk through Dharma gates, and to see the unexpected, experience the unexpected, to experience what you thought you knew anew, to have something known revealed as unknown. As I get older, I find that outer travel, even though my work takes me there, to other places, other countries. Sightseeing has less and less appeal. I'm very interested in museums because, and archaeological sites, because I'm very interested in what, how, how man has lived and continually tried to improve, mankind continually tried to improve, and what spiritual basis they've had, you know, what has sustained them. But sightseeing for itself has less and less appeal. Like Hogan and I went up in the Eiffel Tower a few years ago. And the view from the top was very interesting. It was a different perspective on the city of Paris. So you know how it is when you're way up high in the little tiny buildings and then the little streets and you can see the pattern that they were built in and then you can see people like little ants going about their business. And you can imagine all the people who have lived and loved and fought and loved and suffered and rejoiced and died there over the centuries. But you know, the memory of that has has faded. Been there, yeah. At least I have some pictures in my mind of having been there. Saw, Saw that sight from the top of the Eiffel Tower, but Has it transformed my life? 
Does it help me be a kinder person? No, I don't think so. And as soon as I die, those memories will be, I mean, they're fading already, but they'll be completely gone. So of what use will that be? <clears throat> However, the insights that, I've, that have appeared as I've traveled outwardly, but more importantly, and more often on the inner journeys, while seated on this cushion, or the one that was its parent before, its predecessor, those inner journeys, courtesy of the Zen Inward Adventures Travel Company, have stayed with me and grown and continued to inform and guide my life and inspire my life. So especially as we get older and we have less and less energy and we know we have fewer and fewer years, I find it's really important to contemplate what, how do I want to spend that remaining energy? What's the most important thing to do? Again, Dogen Zenji, to carry the self forward and realize the 10,000 dharmas is delusion. That the 10,000 dharmas advance and realize the self is enlightenment. This is the turning point of the fifth day. The possibility of going on and having deeper awarenesses arise. So in the beginning, we're carrying the self forward. You know, we're concentrating, okay? I'm a concentrated self. I'm an unconcentrated self. This self is succeeding in this period. This self is not succeeding in that period. Now I'm going down to lunch. I wonder what they'll have for lunch. I don't like this. I do like this. So we carry the self forward and we practice. That's what we practice with. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just what is. And this self wants to realize the 10,000 dharmas. Thank goodness. That's rare. It's rare to have the opportunity to study the 10,000 dharmas. That the 10,000 dharmas advance and realize the self is enlightenment. So that's when the pivot turns. The sixth ancestor said, Something like this. At first, we're turning the wheel of dharma. Mm -hmm. We're practicing. Then the wheel of dharma begins to turn us, that switch. Soon we had a long, long time ago at Large Mountain, went on to do Tibetan practice. And she did one whole week of mantra. So chanting mantra outwardly, and then when you weren't in the hall, chanting mantra, chanting it inwardly. And she said about the fourth or fifth day, the mantra began to chant. She wasn't chanting it anymore. So that's what this is talking about. As we lose this constricted sense of self and we join the true self, the flow of activity, change, then the practice begins to turn us. The mantra begins to chant us. Inside the circle, the self vanishes. This is samadhi. This is samadhi. When we lose track of time, when time expands, contracts, when we lose uh, track of the pain in our body, when we lose track of this poor self, this troubled self, and the 10,000 dharmas advance and become the whole of our experience, that is samadhi. Neither existent nor non-existent, intimately conveying spiritual energy, it subtly turns the mysterious pivot. When the mysterious pivot finds opportunity to turn, it's up to us to create that opportunity which is exactly what Sashin is about. When the mysterious pivot finds opportunity to turn, the original light auspiciously appears. How fortunate. How fortunate we are. 
Hongzhir's guidepost for the Hall of Pure Bliss, we set the sage for the pivot to turn. We cannot force it to turn. We are not in charge of cause and effect. And the very act of trying to force it to turn prevents it from turning. Or prevents us from seeing that it has already turned. That there is no turning. Samadhi and wisdom seem to be two different things, samadhi and insight. But the sixth ancestor says they're not. In the Platform Sutra, which is a record of his preaching, he says, learned audience in my system, dhyana, samadhi, and prajna are fundamental. But do not be under the wrong impression that these two are independent of each other. For they are inseparably united and are not two entities. Samadhi is the quintessence of prajna, wisdom. While prajna is the activity of samadhi. That's very intriguing, isn't it? Prajna is the activity of samadhi. He goes on, argument is unnecessary for an enlightened disciple to argue whether prajna or samadhi comes first would put one in the same position as those who are under delusion. Argument implies a desire to win, strengthens egotism, and ties us to the belief that the idea of a self, a being, a living being, and a person ties us to the belief in those ideas. So stop the arguments in the mind. Learned audience, to what are samadhi and prajna analogous? So analogies often help us understand something that seems mysterious. Hmm? They are analogous to a lamp and its light. With the lamp, there is light. Without it, it would be dark. The lamp is the quintessence of the light, and the light is the expression of the lamp. In name, they are two things, but in substance, they are one and the same. It is the same with samadhi and prajna. So again, we don't take what the sixth ancestor says as the truth and just repeat it. This is something to investigate. This is a koan. Are samadhi and wisdom the same thing? And if so, how? There are a number of koans that speak of going beyond the limits of the individual mind. Ordinary mind is not the way. Nonsense said. Mind is not the way. Well, then, what kind of mind is the way? An experience of mind that at first seems extraordinary. I sat with a quiet, open mind for five minutes. That was so great. It is. I'm not, I'm not laughing at that. It is great. It was a ma- an amazing experience. My mind is open and everything was quiet. But then I began to wonder. (laughs) What's the point of just sitting here with an empty mind? Are you sure I'm not losing my ability to think? Could it be early dementia? I'm just doing things without thinking about them. I'm just watching my hands take care of me. That's weird. Maybe I'm going crazy. I had an Aunt Sally who was mentally ill. Maybe I'm... (laughs) But spacious mind is not extraordinary. It seems extraordinary when we rediscover it. We've all experienced it, at least briefly. We've all been transported into the experience, not just in the meditation hall, but anywhere, into the total experience of presence. Watching, 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 and then being drawn into a waterfall. The separation and the bright arcing of a single drop, and then it rejoins the translucent column, perpetual flow of the waterfall. 
listening, 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 and then being drawn into the fabric of music. Merging, merging, losing, where your skin ends and the skin of your lover begins. So we've all had those moments of presence. And we call them extraordinary. But Nansen is telling us it's not extraordinary. It's the most basic experience, the most ordinary experience. It's the experience of of young children and of animals. So one student was telling me about when her daughter was very young and they went to visit a relative, and this little baby was crawling around quite young, and she discovered a book and somehow knew how to turn pages. They'd never seen her do that. And she turned the page and then, and then went, <laughs> and then another page, and, <laughs> and the adults just stopped and watched her in amazement. So this is not something we have to make or manufacture. This is already ours. It's just been covered up in us by the raucous music and endless spinning merry-go-round of incessant thoughts and emotions. So (laughs) once I um, took part in an experiment uh, with psilocybin at Johns Hopkins where they're studying the effect of people taking psilocybin on people who have just been given a cancer diagnosis or addiction. and They wanted some people with, you know, 300,000 hours of sitting practice. And it, it was very interesting. <laughs> got, and they wanted people who were naive to psychedelics, which I was. And, but the, the experience began with, um, it was like being on a roller coaster, but the wall in a, inside a tunnel, and the walls of the tunnel were covered in these horrible patterns, just dreadful colors and dreadful patterns. And this music was playing. It was like an insane organ grinder. It's horrible, horrible music. And you know, being naive to these experiences, I thought, well, they said it would last about seven or eight hours. But I've done session, so I can <laughs> I can stay with this for seven or eight hours. <laughs> yeah, and all the time I, you know, I had this awareness that this is my mind plus this this substance. Because I've sat for hours, knowing this is my mind, on drugs, <laughs> right. On the drug of anger, the drug of, you know, indignation or jealousy or whatever. Yeah. And it doesn't mean it wasn't overwhelming at times, you know, that like pulls you into the, into whatever's happening, especially when they were playing music. But there was an awareness of this is just the mind plus something. So we have an ordinary mind that is not the way. I agree, my ordinary mind does cause me distress. And then we sit and, aha, oh, I've experienced extraordinary mind, and it is the way. And then over time, we begin to balance thinking with awareness, activity and pure being, distraction and presence. And as we learn to balance, we're able to keep what seems to be a door between the two. They're actually the same, but it seems like there's a door. We're able to keep that door open and to rest more and more in the peace and stability and warmth and intimacy and infinite perspective of awareness, of pure awareness. Until there's a knock on the door and an event peeks in and announces, rational mind needed now. And we get up and we act with whatever comes forward, hopefully in more and more appropriate ways. And then as soon as rational mind is not needed, we go back to 
self-awareness. This takes time. It takes lots of time. And practice, lots of practice. And there's this kind of odd um, idea that you know we can get enlightened overnight. And some of the stories of the ancestors further that illusion, because it, it says, you know, a monk in all earnestness asked, La, okay, his question, or her question, and then the master says something, or punches them, or pushes them down, or blows out the candle, and then they're enlightened. But in all earnestness could mean 25 years of very, very serious practice. And we don't expect in other aspects of our life, like if we don't, we sit down at the piano for the first time and, you know, flex our fingers like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and play a Bach Canada, you know. We sort of have that expectation in practice. It's very weird. We expect to sit down on the cushion for seven days, yell a little moo, touch a little samadhi, and ping, you've arrived at the hundredth floor. Enlightenment. Please watch your step as you exit. Actually, that's very good advice in Brazil, where I just traveled. Now now a fading memory, except that the memory of how warm the people were. Such warm hearts. It was, that was amazing to me. Such, it's, it's, it's palpable warmth. But watch your step as you exit is very good advice in Brazil. Where on the walls, outside an elevator, often there's a sign that reads, when the doors open, please check that a car has arrived. Okay. (laughs) I think I'll be very mindful when the doors open. (laughs) Because you could be talking to somebody, you know, and just step in. (laughs) Enlightenment experiences are wonderful, but not if they make us forget how to live in the world which contains elevator cars that aren't there when the doors open, and driving on the correct side of the middle line. So you drive carefully on the right side of the middle line with presence. Aware of your body, aware of the car, aware of the road, and aware of the interesting tone, musical tone of the towers on the road. Or as you open your heart and send As you drive, you open your heart and send a flow of loving kindness. Prayers for contentment to each driver or homeless person or fallen tree or cow or dead possum or driver in those huge trucks that spray water and blind you briefly as they pass. So bit by bit, we learn to balance presence and thinking. From the record of the transmission of the light, which is a collection of enlightenment stories of the ancestors, and is taken on as a a series of koans at the end of the collection of koans. This is from the sixth Indian ancestor, Michaka. He was a very accomplished wizard, and it's said that he led 8,000 wizards. So these are stories that point to Continuing on. So he had a, you know, very successful career as a wizard. (laughs) (laughs) And he encountered um, the fifth ancestor. And the fifth ancestor told him, the Buddha said, Practicing wizardry and studying the small is like being dragged with a rope. You yourself should know that if you leave the small stream and immediately enter the great ocean, you will realize the birthless. Hearing this, the master experienced awakening. So who knows, maybe being a wizard prepared him. You know, wizards... uh, Magicians are always making things appear out of emptiness. We have a koan. Emptiness is form. So maybe there they have a little insight into that. 
or into helping people understand that. So then after that, um, he became a monk, took the precepts and became a monk. And the other wizards felt proud of themselves at first. But then uh, Dritaka, who was the, the teacher who was, he encountered, exerted great supernatural powers. As a result, all the 8,000 wizards uh, aroused the thought of enlightenment and simultaneously became monks. 8,000 wizards became monks. <laughs> The Indian stories are so great because they're, they're, they're full of this kind of magic. You know? But if our being at a little more peace for this week has helped 8,000 people in the world become a little more at peace, or just the 65 here at more peace, and then anyone we encounter and anyone they encounter, that could be 8,000. We don't know. Yeah. My daughter just uh, was telling me she's been very, very, very nervous because she's applying for a new nursing job. And she called me for advice. If they asked me this question, what should I say? She was really, really wound up. And I got her calmed down. We talked about stories that she's told me that would be examples she could use when they ask her questions about her experience. And then she called me after the interview, and she said... Um, Somebody told them that they knew me. She said, I realized that even the small things you do, you have no idea of the effect. And in the interview, they, the woman who was interviewing her said, do you know Pamela? And my daughter said, mm. and the woman said, Pamela worked at um, where you work, at Vibra. And my daughter said, really? Why? And she said, well, Pamela said that you helped her once. And my daughter said, it was such a small thing. She was a new nurse, and a patient started going, we call it going down the tubes in medicine. <laughs> I mean, you're going to need a lot of tubes. <laughs> so she said, patients started going down the tubes, and this new nurse didn't know what to do. And so my daughter just stopped what she was doing and stepped in and helped her. And she said, it was such a small thing. I didn't, I didn't remember it happening. But it could be the pivot that turns that gets her this job, you know? Or that helps inspire that nurse in some way to help somebody else. And then it gets passed on, and 8,000 people could be converted to a life of more kindness and peace. This is... Um, Gayashata, the 18th ancestor, was the venerable Gayashata. He served the venerable Sanganandi. One time he heard the sound of the wind blowing the bronze bells in the temple. The venerable Sanganandi asked Gayashata, are the bells ringing or is the wind ringing? Gayashata replied, it is neither the bells nor the wind, it is my mind that is ringing. The Venerable asked, and who is the mind? Gayashata replied, because both are silent. The Venerable said, excellent, excellent. Who but you will succeed to my way? When the mind ground is prepared, a single question that is given to us or that we give to ourselves can turn the pivot. This is again from the Sixth Ancestors Platform Sutra. The capacity of the mind is as great as that of space. It is infinite, neither round nor square, neither great nor small, neither green nor yellow, neither red nor white, neither above nor below, neither long nor short, neither angry nor happy, neither right nor wrong, neither good nor evil, neither first nor last. All Buddha lands are as empty as space. Intrinsically, our transcendental nature is empty and not a single dharma, 
Not a single phenomena can be attained. It is the same with the essence of mind, which is the state of emptiness of form. Learned audience, when you hear me talk about the emptiness, do not at once fall into the idea of vacuity, because this involves the heresy of the doctrine of annihilation. It is of the utmost importance that we should not fall into this idea, because when a person sits quietly and keeps their mind blank, they will abide in the state of emptiness of indifference. Learned audience, the, in, the illimitable emptiness of the universe is capable of holding myriads of things of various shape and form, such as the sun, the moon, the stars, mountains, rivers, people, dharmas, pertaining to goodness or badness, the deva plains, the hells, the great oceans, and all the mountains in the universe. Space, take, space takes all of these in, and so does the emptiness of our nature. We say that the essence of mind is great because it embraces all things, since all things are within our own nature. When we see the goodness or the badness of other people, we're not attracted by it, nor repelled by it, nor attached to it. So that our attitude of mind is as empty as space. In this way, we say that our mind is great. So he's speaking directly to the spaciousness of mind, which we call empty, or still, or silent. But it actually contains everything. So it's simultaneously this foundation of stillness, of no time. And it is everything, everything that arises So I say, learned audience, just as you are sitting here, in comfort, discomfort, confusion, or clarity, you, you, yourself, are the unique and perfect expression of the one great timeless and boundless presence. The presence which is at once silent, still, and eternal, and the humming source out of which all things, including you, arise, and to which they all return, including you. You have arisen as particles, many, many molecules, surrounded by space. You are called by your name. You are now held together temporarily by the forces of cause and effect. And when they loosen and dissolve, you will return. If you have come to recognize it, to love it, you will always be at home. And if you lose sight of it, which we all do, which we all do, we lose sight of it and we get confused. Remember the refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the great companionship of the Sangha. All of these can help you find your way back home. Thank you.